Welcome to the Grueling Truths NFL Legends Show, brought to you by Gridiron Mo. Gridiron Mo is an interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. As always, for the Legends Show, I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster, and I want to welcome in one of what I think is one of the greatest defensive tackles in NFL history, six-time Pro Bowler. Help me welcome to the show former Detroit Lions and Los Angeles Rams defensive tackle, Roger Brown. Mike, thank you for having me on your show, Greg. Oh, it's an honor to have you on. Um, like I said, I mean, my dad always talked about you, said what a great player you were, and just from the film I saw and the teams you played on, you played on two great teams, early 60s and then in the late 60s. So at what age did you first develop your love for football? I think it was in high school up in New York State, a place called Nyack, New York. And I was on a safety patrol. And I saw I was patrolling the stadium as an eighth grader. And there was a football game out on the field, and it looked interesting. And that's how I got started. All right, now you played high school football up there, as you said, and then you ended up choosing Maryland Eastern Shore to play your college football. Um, Why did you choose to go there? Well, because back then you got to think about in those years there were a lot of the southern uh, big schools that were still segregated. Yeah. In fact, I got letters when I was at a high school in Nyack from Duke University, from North Carolina, and the coach up there said, I don't think they know who you are. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I I decided to – I had an opportunity to go to Michigan State and uh, Syracuse, but um, I had to improve on my grade point average. Then they said, we will accept a transfer. Yeah. But after going to Maryland State, I had such a ball down there and enjoyed the people, I decided to stay there. All right. Now, when did you first think during your college career that you could possibly be an NFL player? My high school yearbook, you know, in your picture as a senior, you always write down or wish. And I had my wish and goal was to play in the National Football League. So that was way back when. Before college, I had a desire to play in the NFL. All right, now you were drafted by the Rams in 1960. What were your third, or you were drafted in 1960 by the Lions. Sorry about that. What were your thir- first thoughts about going to Detroit? I wasn't thinking much of anything because I didn't even know anything about the team. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. I knew there were teams in the NFL. But it, some of the kids had said, hey, you've been drafted number four by the Lions. I said, that's great. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the start. All right. Now, you get to the Rams in 1960. I mean, what was your first training camp with the Rams? Uh, or not the Rams, but the Lions. I mean, you had guys like Alex Karras. I mean, what, what are you, some of your – your memories of training camp that first time? Well, you know, i got to go back a little bit because I had the distinct pleasure of playing back in 1960 in Chicago, Illinois, and this was the college, um, the college football game that they played, always played the championship at oh, the College Field. All-Star game, was it? College All-Star game. Yeah, I played in that, and I was the second uh, player from an all-black school to play in that game. Uh, just before me, the few year, a year or so before me, Johnny Sample played in that College All-Star, and then I had an opportunity to play in it in 1960 against the Baltimore Colts. And... From there, I uh, met a lot of friends and I met a lot of guys that turned out to be my best buds, and that was Gail Cogdale at Washington State, uh, also drafted by the Lions. So we became good buds. 
Plus, there was a Bruce Maher playing in the game and Max Messner. So the, th- the three of us, once the game was over, was going to go to Detroit. And we got in there on a Saturday night in Detroit. That, that night, the Lions had a scrimmage. And, the next, and we suited up, and I was playing in the game. Didn't know the plays, didn't know anything. But it's all the same when you play. Yeah. You, now, a lot of people just, don't realize the first fearsome foursome was in the early 1960s with the Detroit Lions. You had yourself, Darius McCord, Sam Williams, Alex Karras. Where did that name first originate from? There was a sports writer <clears throat> up in Pontiac, Michigan, a guy named Bruno Kearns. And Bruno gave us the name, the fearsome foursome. And that, that stuck. I mean, we became known as the original fearsome foursome. And after that, just about every team adopted a name for their defensive line. All right, it's you want to talk curtain. a little bit of Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah but you, you want to talk a little bit about that group? Alex Karras, everybody remembers him. Darius McCord, Sam Williams. I mean, you want to talk a little bit about what made you guys such a great group together? Well, the main thing back then, a lot of people forget that the coach that we had in 1960 on defense was none other than Don Shula. And when Don first started his career in the NFL, he was a coach with us, and so was Les Bingaman on the defensive side. So it was a situation where we had a good group, and they left. Don left a lot of the things up to us. Between Sam and I, we had a chance to call stunts, and, and and some of the plays we had, we would drop back and cover for a linebacker. We did all kinds of nutty things. But they gave us an opportunity to think for ourselves. Now, you, you talk about Don Shula, one of the great coaches in NFL history, Hall of Famer. I think he was the coordinator with that team. Do you want to talk a little bit about what made Coach Shula such a great coach? Well, the main thing, he studied the game He knew what he had to do, and he knew the only way I'm going to get the job done is to get it done through these guys. So it wasn't a situation where, okay, put your uniform on, go out on the field, and kill. You know, you had a game plan. And Don Shula was a student of the game. He was very knowledgeable, and he was a good motivator. And uh, that was all, and you put all of those things together, and you put four great guys. And the one thing you got to remember also, Mike, is that we had behind us some of the best defensive uh, linebackers and deep backs in the league. When you look at a night train lane, a Joe Schmidt, a Brett Schneider, um, uh, you know, you had some good guys there. And I think the defensive line, by putting pressure on a quarterback, stopping a lot of plays from getting through the line of scrimmage, helped them as well. In fact, when you look at the uh, defensive line backs, just about all of them now are in the Hall of Fame. I mean, Dick LeBeau, Nitrine Lane, uh, Yale Larry, Joe Schmidt, I mean, they're all there. So I'm just saying, what are you waiting for here on the defensive line? We did our job. (laughs) You and Kara should have been in a long time ago. I think so. Now, probably your most famous game with the Lions was the 1962 Thanksgiving Day game where Bart Starr was sacked 11 times by the Lions, seven by you alone. Mm -hmm. What What are some of your memories of that game? Well, that particular game, we had a good two weeks to build up hatred and a determination that we were going to go out and just annihilate them if we could. Yeah, because you lost a really close game where you had to lead in the last two minutes in Green Bay a couple weeks before then. That's right. And um, um, 
Terry Barr slipped, and Herb Adderley intercepted the ball and ran it back, and they kicked the field goal and beat us by a couple of points. And we were just bound and determined back then for the Thanksgiving Day game to play the best game that we could play. And the one good thing that you think about Thanksgiving Day in those early 60s, the only football game on national television and radio was the Thanksgiving Day game between Green Bay and Detroit. Yeah, and there was only one Thanksgiving Day game back then. That's all there was, and everybody was watching. So I knew then that all my old high school buds and all the people that I played in college were watching that game, and I was going to show them that I was bound and determined to be a good player in that league. Now, you guys ended up winning that game, I think, like 26-14, to 14, wasn't it? I think 27-14, yeah. Yeah, something like that. But 1960-62, to 62, the Lions had a very good, borderline great team, great defense. It dropped off after the 62 season. Was that from the loss of Shula, or were there other factors that contributed to it? Well, I think there was a lot of things that uh, – when did Don leave? And, and he, he left about 63. Yeah, he left after 62 and became the head coach of the Colts. And Colts. I believe, yeah. Baltimore Colts. Well, we lost him, plus it was a different situation. And I, I can't tell you what happened at that time. But a lot of it had to do with Don leaving. A lot of it had to do with the head coach leaving. I mean, yeah. we lost just about every – we lost the coach. Uh, <laughs> we lost defensive coaches, offensive head coaches. And we got in some some kind of dingbat coaches. <laughs> I mean, Harry Gilmer and some others. i got to call it like it is, you know. And Detroit's it's, had that problem for the last 50 years, too. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, we invented oopses. <laughs> but but that that's the way it go. And then to turn around, to give you an idea, back in those days, we came in second five times. I was on five teams that came in second. That is almost going from the penthouse to the outhouse and not winning the big one. Now, if you remember also, they used to have a game down in uh, Miami, and we used to call it the runner-up bowl. Yeah. Well, I played in that thing five times, one with, with the, no, I think two with L.A. and three with the Detroit Lions. Talk about a, a real bad complex to come in out of a 10-year career five times in second place. Wow. And, and you talked about the runner-up bowl. I've always wanted to know this. I, I've interviewed a few guys that played in it, but always forgot to ask. What is it like to play in something called the runner-up bowl? Well, I think Vince Lombardi had the, the right name. And he said, if it's not the number one bowl, and that's for the championship, it is the toilet bowl. And I've always referred to it as the toilet bowl. I played in it that many times. But it was good the first year we went down there. You got a chance to take your family, and you kind of had a vacation out of it. But after the second year, it got old. And... um, wasn't very excited because it, we were the home team, you could say, because we were always there. <laughs> All right. Now, another question uh, that I always wanted to get a Detroit Lion from the early 60s on and ask was there was a book that was read in a movie made, Paper Lion, by George Plimpton. I think he was in training camp with you guys in 1963. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that experience? Oh, you bet. As you know, with all the training camps you put in as a, as a football player in the league, uh, that was the most fun, the most enjoyable training camp I've ever had is when George Plimpton came 
to Cranbrook and and uh, to do this story about the paper lion and he had an opportunity to play. We had fun with him. Uh, we wanted to make sure he understood that this isn't just fun and games and you're going to sit down after it's over and write a book about it. You need to have a taste of what it's like. So yeah. we were a little rough on him a couple of times, but uh, other than that, it was it was okay. Oh, come on. He only weighed like 120 pounds, Roger. Y'all didn't have to be rough on him. <laughs> well, we wanted him to know that it wasn't all... You know, he, he did the thing with uh, Archie Moore. He boxed with Archie Moore. He pitched in the major leagues. He was like a Walter Mitty, but the <laughs> best guy in the world and a lot of fun. All right, now, fun. It, it sounds like you had an enjoyable experience in Detroit. What were your feelings about being traded to the Rams after the 1966 season? I wasn't very happy about being traded to anybody, to tell you the truth because I wanted to do my career in Detroit. I lived there. I just got married. I just bought a house. And a week later, they were shipping me off. And this was another one of those head coaches that we had, Joe Schmidt. Uh, Joe Schmidt became the head coach, and he told Carl Brett Schneider that I wanted to see him after practice. He's got a deal for me. So the only thing I could think, oh, man, Joe's got an endorsement or a commercial. I can make some extra money here. So I go in his office to talk to him, and he says, I've traded you to the L.A. Rams. I say, you what? I've traded you to the Rams. I have since found out, because I've had a grudge against Joe ever since for trading me off, but I've since found out that he traded me to get a quarterback for the Lions. Now, don't ask me to explain how it works and how does he get a quarterback by trading me to the Rams when the, when the Rams didn't have, they had Roman Gabriel, but that was it. But yeah. that's the story he told me. He had to get a quarterback. So that's life. Well, another Detroit screw-up. <laughs> hey. I felt like a bag of groceries, man. I was being shipped off. Hey, but the good thing, you got shipped to a team that had a new coach in George Allen who had turned them around. I think 66, they were 7-5. and five. Um, You played on another team that is, I mean, is generally known by most people that don't know this story of Detroit as the fearsome foursome with yourself, Lamar Lundy, Deacon Jones, Merlin Olsen. I mean, you had guys like Eddie Metter in the defensive backfield. You had a great football team. You want to talk about that defense and maybe the differences between Detroit and L.A.? Well, the L.A. Rams, I was happy going out there. Once I got there, it was great to play with Deacon. And I used to see these guys about every year for the, for the Pro Bowl because they were always on the team, so we knew one another. And I knew Rosie from his days back with the New York Giants. So it was like an old home week. I didn't, didn't, miss, didn't miss a step. You knew the guys. You knew the plays. You knew the whole thing. I was excited going out there. And then we had the four of us and George Allen playing with him, who was a great coach, uh, had, had set it up. Where, where all of a sudden he was saying that as soon as Rosie Greer's ankle or Achilles heel, 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 can't even say the word, but as soon as he got well, he was going to have a five-man defensive line. But that never did come to pass. And Rosie was a great singer and still is. So we did a lot of TV shows. Oh, we were just... Yeah, I, rem- I remember seeing those. I remember, I think they did, didn't they do a the NFL Films thing? They, I think they did something on either the Fearsome Foursome or Deacon Jones. Well, it, we, they did one of those that, uh, Football Life. Yeah. And we also did uh, Chuck Barris, uh, who used to be on TV back then, and we did the Hollywood Palace. 
And uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. Pick up a couple of extra dollars here and there. And I said, good grief, this, this sinking thing is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't think it's any coincidence that the two defenses you played on that were so great were both coached by legendary coaches. You talked about George Allen. You want to kind of compare George Allen's coaching style to Don Shula's? Well, I would say George and Don were were almost like two peas in a pod. They were thorough. Uh, They had a desire to win. They liked you as a player and as a person. And they wanted to win, and you knew this. So you knew that if you could do what they say they needed done, you're going to make some money and you'll get another good contract next year. But uh, they were great coaches, and and to play with two of the greatest coaches in the NFL in history, I I feel blessed. And the 1967 Rams were a lot like those 62 Lions, a great team that could have won a championship. And, I mean, I I think the real injustice here is the 67 Rams, I think you guys beat the Cowboys and the Packers in the regular season. You had a better record than the Packers by a couple games. But you still had to go play in five-degree weather in Green Bay, and your season ended there. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about those circumstances? Well, you know, those are, those, that's where you rise above it all. You can't let the weather throw you back because I don't care where you were born and where you live. Cold weather is cold weather. Mud and rain is still the same. There, there's no excuse I could make for what we did or didn't do. And we didn't take care. We didn't. The Green Bay Packers, I remember one playoff game, we played them in Milwaukee. And they had this guy we used to call a road runner, Travis Williams. Yeah. I think he had the best game he's ever had in his whole life. That one game, we couldn't stop him. He was running like a demon. But to play for two good coaches, as I did, to get an opportunity to make a few extra bucks, you've got to seize the moment. And we have no excuse for inferior football than we had in all those playoff games that I was in. All right, now your career, I think you made six straight Pro Bowls. Um, what was the Pro Bowl like to play in back then? Well, back then it was like going on vacation. It was uh, because there were certain plays you couldn't have, certain things you couldn't do, but you played the game and you didn't want anybody else to know any of your secrets. But it was, it was kind of fun, um, kind of fun. and, and you, you played about a quarter, then the other guy would play a quarter, then the other guy would play a quarter, so it, it wasn't very much. I know there are rumors now that they may even stop it or discontinue the Pro Bowl. We would go to the L.A. Coliseum and play. For six years I did that. Now they go. To Hawaii. Can you imagine that thing? Makes it a lot better, doesn't it, Roger? (laughs) They didn't want me to go. I know what it was. (laughs) (laughs) Now, like like we said, your career was only like nine, ten years. What made you decide to retire at kind of an early age? Well, the thing that that made me, and and i got to tell you, my first year of playing in the NFL, I got a $8,000 contract. And then the coaches that signed me said, "Well, we're going to we're going to give you a $300 bonus." Took the $300 out of the $8,000 contract and wrote the contract for 7,700. Then then I was out in LA and in the meantime I had started restaurants in Chicago. And I had four restaurants that were making way more money than they were paying me. And I told the coach, this is a, it's a business decision. And uh, right now I could have my restaurants for the rest of my life, but I can't play football the rest of my life. 
So I'm needed to run the restaurants. So I left. And I'm still in the restaurant business. Yeah, you got a restaurant in Virginia, isn't it? I got two of them here now. Um, One is in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, and it's called Roger Brown's Restaurant and Sports Bar. And it's a 16,000 square foot restaurant. It's good size. It's almost like a stadium. Yeah, and then we good. have another one. We have another one up in Newport News, Virginia. It's called the Cove Tavern, and that's in city center in Newport News. All right. And the other thing that I found out about you by a little research, you were the first 300 pounder to play in NFL history. How did that affect you after your career? Well, it it did to a de- it didn't bother me because I was big all my life. Yeah. And I could handle that. That was the fastest thing. I could run a 10-flat 100 at, at almost 300 pounds. Uh, so I, got, I, could, I could, the weight wasn't a hindrance. The only thing after playing football and owning restaurants, yeah. I blew up to 448 pounds. And well, what was the I, thing that got you to change that? Because I know I saw pictures of you, and you can't be more than 225, 230 right now. Probably. Right now, I'm 211. There you go. But the thing that made me change it was carrying all the weight around and how much trouble I would have at a later date in my life if I didn't get the weight off me. So do you watch the NFL nowadays? Oh, Yeah. Every Sunday we got uh, we got the TVs in the restaurant on. All right. So, what defensive tackles or defensive end, defensive linemen that really impress you to play today that you like to watch play? Defense. Yeah. I can't. I can't really think of any that that I would compare myself or that I envied. Uh, most of the good ones, as far as I'm concerned, played back in the days that I played. Defensive yeah, I ends, Marilyn Olson, Karras. I don't think there's anyone out there. And, and, and I know there's one guy that I was so disappointed in, and that was uh, Albert Hainsworth. Yeah. Uh, they paid this guy buku buck. And to me, I don't think he was worth it, or he really showed the world that he was worthy of $114 million. Yeah, it is hard to be worthy of $114 million anyway. Oh, boy, I tell you. And me, I got $8,000. Most ever made in the NFL was $13,000. Yeah. So. So. Other than the restaurant, we got to wrap this up here in a little bit. I know you're probably busy with the restaurant, but other than your restaurant, what occupies your days right now? Well, believe it or not, uh, nine kids, 14 grands, and five greats keep me going. (laughs) Plus, I do a lot of uh, banquets. I was just up in city center two days ago. We did the one, the marathon, and... uh, I spoke at the Marriott Hotel right across the street from the uh, Cove restaurant, my restaurant up there. And so I I stay busy. Uh, I get a lot of requests for schools. I'm a member of the Rotary here in Portsmouth. And so I stay busy. All right. Well, hey, once again, it really complete honor to have you on the show. Glad you took a half hour out to talk to us. Hey, thanks for asking me. Well, anytime you want to come on, you're always welcome. Okay. All right, Thank guys. you very much. Uh, hey, thank you, Roger. I want okay. to remind everybody to go check out thegruelingtruth.net, where you get your interviews with Roger Brown. Um, other old Rams, we had Eddie Metter on a couple weeks ago, so make sure you check all those out. Um, coming up this week, well, we've got a few guys scheduled that we're keeping as a surprise that we'll announce on the website tomorrow night. Make sure you check out footballvideos.com and gridironmo.com. So for Roger Brown, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>